Welcome back to the programme. Now, it's been the biggest success story on Irish television in recent years. Fans of the series Love, Hate are impatiently waiting for its return to our screens on Sunday week. Well, sitting opposite me is one of the stars, some would say the star of the show, uh, Tom Von Lawler, also known as Kingpin Nidge, also witnessed as King Nidge with a crown on his head. But before we start talking about the phenomenon that is Nidge and indeed Love Hate, let's have a listen uh, to King Nidge in action at the end of season three. Darling, what's the story, brother? What's the story? <laughs> I'll tell you what the story is, Nidge. You just tried to have me clipped there and you missed. Do you hear me? Darren, I... I swear to... Darren! Darren! Tom, first of all, you're very welcome to the Thank programme you. and congratulations on a stunning success. Who is Nidge? Um. <laughs> I've been watching loads of, of things when you walked in the door I thought it was Nidge coming in <laughs> <laughs> Yeah it's an interesting question I, I uh, one of the, the joys of playing the part is that he's a, he's changes in every, he's a different man in all four series he's always changing so he's an incredibly difficult man to pinpoint in terms of who exactly he is or how people would say what his um, how he's affected or his condition, if you want to think about it in terms of um, a psychological profile. Uh, I think he's uh, a million different things. I think he's... Uh, it's the strange thing of why people are drawn to him. He's uh, he's capable of great acts of evil, but he, he's also capable of great moments of surprising tenderness or humour. Or oh, tenderness? Yeah, there are times you see moments with his children... Uh, Moments with his own conscience. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I think he's incredibly psychologically rich, and I think that's why people are fascinated by him. Is he stupid? I think he's the opposite. I think he's an incredibly shrewd. Uh, he's still alive. I think that's testament to his survival instinct. I think earlier on in the show, he was uh, in the first couple of series. Mm. He was. Um, I suppose he would be considered have been considered a slightly uh, more comic, not comic creation, but I suppose the weight of uh, of the of the comedy side fell to him. But I think as the the show has become more darker, he's become more darker in it. And I think now he's come centre stage in terms of stepping out of John Boy's uh, shadow. He's achieved what he thought he wanted to achieve, and now he's there. He wonders whether or not that's what he always wanted. Yeah, because it's a scary place to be, isn't it? Yeah, it's an incredibly scary place to be. I think, again, why he's fascinating is that he's beginning to question the 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 reason of what he does and and his kind. Without saying, there are moments he has where he questions his self in relation to his universe or the universe. I mean, that sounds kind of existentialist, but I think he there are moments peppered throughout the, this coming series and last series where he has these kind of moments where he looks at himself, where he looks at the life he leads and he wonders where what it means, what power means, what money means, what control means, what respect means, and that's why he's fascinating. I, I mean, it, it, what, what is worrying in some ways about it is that I am told that this is very, very realistic. I mean, the amount of killings. The other thing is, as I was saying to you, I had been looking at back issues before I was going to talk to you. The amount of killing. Yeah. That even as a viewer, you lose your sensitivity to it. You know, you yeah. lose. And like if somebody particularly nasty gets done and they put him into the grave, one of them is like, ups a daisy and yeah. you think, my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's really... Uh I think because it's such a visible presence or the uh, the victims of drug culture in Dublin are so visible in Dublin and because we see it so much in our media and Dublin's a small city in that way, it's kind of, it's very visible. But I think what Stuart Carolyn, the writer, does is that he's very, very specific about showing the repercussions of these acts of violence and these killings. One of the, my, one of the episodes, one of the moments that really affected me while watching it last year was that moment, I think it's in the second series, where Darren's ordered to kill a man and he shoots 
he he answers the door he shoots him and then he sees his wife there she sees him he shoots her. and then the bit that really levels you is when he's going at the door and he hears the baby cry upstairs and that bit as a father and uh, as a viewer watching it divorced from the show it really hits you on an incredible level and it hits him I think it's not he doesn't saunter out the door w- untouched by it and Darren yeah, he, yeah you know he's he's a fascinating character in the sense that he's killed more people in the show than anyone yet he's, that's right but his, his what's fascinating about him is that he's forever trying to escape the world he's always being drawn back in be it a debt or be it an act of revenge or he's forever trying to escape that life and he's always being pulled back and he's wrestling with his own conscience in terms of what he does. Well, the interesting thing about Darren and, I mean, the amount of people he killed for you is unreal. Yeah. And then I was thinking to myself, like I had a slight soft spot for him. Yeah. Well, he's an incredibly charismatic character. He's, uh, again, I think that's why, again, they're fascinating people to play and they're fascinating to watch their men and women with great charisma who've chosen a life that we norm the great majority of us choose not to live they live on the extremes of of existence in terms of their day-to-day living and they're you know i think they're these guys can be very charismatic uh in terms of what they they do that's the, and part of that's the lore of of danger the lore of uh power money sex you know yeah. By the way, somebody asked me to ask you, does he love Trish? <laughs> I think he's the kind of man who would be lost without her. He's the kind of man, if she upsticks and left him, he'd be devastated and he wouldn't know what to do. He's that kind of man, who, one of those men who gives out about his wife internally and then actually when she's gone, he'd be lost. I think he, he, he wouldn't know what to do without her. For all his cheating and all his uh, moaning about her, I think he's... he's lo- he, she's An aggressive like, stuff about her. Yeah, he's not, he can be nasty about her, I think. But I, it's that funny thing that he has that domestic side... He has a family and he that's grounding for him and it keeps him kind of... He can go away and do all this other stuff because he knows she's there for him. So right. he takes her for granted a lot, but, you know. Calling the baby John? Clever, yeah. Very, very clever. Very, yeah, very, very nasty. Very funny, you know, and clever. And it was a very... Well, I remember reading it thinking, God, you know, he's a, he's a man who's obsessed with control and a man who's, who's always thinking ahead. And he talks about calling the baby John so it'll throw the police off the scent. Very clever, yeah. ruthless, uh, but fascinating. Could you imagine in real life having to give evidence against a guy like that? No, I, uh, I mean, no, It's uh, you can understand why that code of silence exists in both in terms of the culture of being called a rat in a community and the culture of fear in terms of us being asked to give evidence. I mean everyone knows each other and and it would very quickly get out who you are, who you know. I think the fascinating thing as well, they talk about the character of Donna in the last series. She, uh, she There's a fascinating thing where the actress was labelled a rat by people in the streets and she kind of was is the bravest person in the entire show or has been or commits the bravest act in that in the face of being told she's going to have acid thrown in her face by the gang, she goes to the police and says, my friend has been raped and I think it may be this man. And that takes incredible, incredible courage. It was an incredible act of bravery. Yeah, but it's funny that she she was on social media, she was labelled, the actress was labelled as a rat and that code of um, silence or that code of, that code of betrayal and of keeping your mouth shut is 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 quite extraordinary. OK, I'm going to have to break it there, if I may, because I have to go uh, for the, to the Angeles and to the newsroom. But I will be talking to Tom Vaughan Lawler, uh, otherwise known as Nidge, after that. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm still with Tom Vaughan Lawler, uh, otherwise known as Nidge, and we're talking, like, backwards and forwards about what has um, what has been such a phenomenal success... Can I ask you a question? Were there a lot of objectors to the programme? Now, I I wouldn't be that keen on violence, but I, I kind of watch from behind the couch or, yeah. you know, through my fingers or whatever. But I'm thinking of that rape scene, raping yeah. Siobhan, God of heaven. Yeah. Um, did, did, did the public go with that altogether or were there huge objections to it? Um. I think th- there were people who had uh, who found it upsetting, and there were, I think, maybe a couple of complaints about it. But I think, again, it's 
which Stuart is uh, he 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 doesn't um, set up a scene or a, a story without without absolutely knowing where it's going. So I think the problem with that, if there had been a problem with that scene, it would have been if the rape had taken place. They'd showed the rape, and it had been the catalyst for the show, which it was, but that it didn't show any the repercussion for Siobhan. But her story, the effect it's had on her as a woman, was charted beautifully, I think, through the six episodes and the fallout in terms of her relationship with her partner, Tommy, her relationship with her child, her relationship with her friends. I think the effect it had on her as a woman uh, was brilliantly played by Charlie Murphy and beautifully written by by Stuart. So I think, understandably, it's upsetting, um, but it's it's always handled with sensitivity. I, I right. think that's why he's a brilliant writer because right. he never makes choices just f- for shock value. It's always a means to an end. That's always been the case. It always amazes me every year we get the same questions about glamorising violence. Yeah. It's a lazy question, I think, because it's... it. If you, I'd love to be shown where it was because right from the first moments of the first scene, it's about a man a man getting shot in the street and the rest of that first episode is about the ritual of burying, the ritual of grief in a community. And so it's always been charted in that way and it's never been, there's never once been a, uh, any killing or anything. It's the same with the drug taking. It's always, you know, in the second series, the, the paranoia that sets in with John Boy as he becomes more and more addicted to cocaine. The, the um, You know, he's obsessed that he has this rat in his gang and he doesn't. And it, it's all about the cycles of... Violence that are never ending, revenge that's sought, that once achieved doesn't achieve anything, yeah. and that's what he's observing. I think, and it's right. it. People talk about it being Shakespearean in its scope and Shakespearean in, in its in its uh, detail and its themes, and it is. That's why we're fascinated by these lives and yeah. why the Godfather, Shakespeare, Greek drama look at people who are who are um, caught up in revenge cycles and how it leads to nothing. And yeah, that's why he's yeah. he's he's a brilliant writer. When you got sight of it at first, yeah. I mean, people, I, we were talking the other break about you, you probably won't be typecast because you live in London yeah. and work there. Yeah. Uh, but you say you'd have to you'd have to run with with that anyway. Did you know the minute you read it that, that this I, was gold dust? Yeah, I think I remember uh, I, I I read it with my my, my now wife. My, my, my wife's uh, English, so I do... She tests me on all my lines, so she does them in her English accent and I do them in my Dublin accent, so it's very, very funny in our Slightly heads. Slightly different Dublin accent <laughs> to the Lynch yeah, accent. Yeah. yeah, So, uh, but I did, the first time I read it, I thought I, I was quite knocked out by it. But you never know how something is going to be. How it's produced. How it's, uh, and yeah, and the different, you know, you need a lot of stars to align, you need a lot of factors. And through the casting and through Stuart and Jane Gogan here at RTE and Suzanne McCauley, the producer, Steve Matthews, they gathered together a team that just kind of gelled and just you had a coming together of kind of magical elements that have kind of grown and grown and grown. And sometimes that pulls out, sometimes even amazing script, but not a great producer. Yeah. But the elements all fell into place and we've it's just become yeah. something. Uh, did you meet any of those gangland type people? To get a sense, of, I mean, I don't know how you go about it. Excuse me, please. Are you yes, a gangland yeah, yeah, murderer? Exactly. Can and I like talk a to you? Chat? And, yeah, yeah. Push, yeah. Um, I, not specifically. I, I, I think you know when we film, you can run into them from time to time, uh, but they, uh, I didn't s- seek them out. I think again, one of the great things about Stuart is he does, without sounding lazy, he does so much of the work for you because his his research is so detailed because. And now we couldn't because we're very recognisable presences or recognisable fe- yes. people, recognised faces. You can't do that anymore. Stuart is on the street. He's anonymous in terms of his visibility. So he's able to go and, and you know, and so say what's going on in certain communities or the temperature in certain places in terms of that culture. And it feeds into his his scripts. And so the characters and the stories come f- almost right. fully formed to us on the page. So... He does all the kind of dirty work. <laughs> what did you do with the homeless? We I, we had this amazing experience. We I, I, I was in a Tesco's and I came out and I met this guy. Uh, I came out and he said, you're the guy from Love Hate. And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, we, uh, he said, his name was Brendan. And he said, oh, we, uh, in the shelter on Harcourt Street, he said, we, uh, we put our money together and we bought the box set and we'd watch it every Wednesday. And it kind of just knocked me out and I said to some of the lads, why don't we go in and do a kind of a questions and answers? And we went in 
and they were incredible. They were welcome and they asked incredibly intelligent questions, insightful questions. And what was incredibly humbling was they had printed off pictures with our faces and asked us to sign them for us. And one guy came up to me and his name was John and he was incredibly gaunt. And he said he was a heroin addict and he was clean nine weeks. And he said, will you write to John, stay clean, love Nidge? And I kind of, it, you know, it's when you get stuff like that, that stuff like that happens, it's incredibly humbling and incredibly, you realise the power of something. You realise it's, uh, it, things are happening, you know, and it's, you kind of, it's just extraordinary yeah. and humbling and beautiful. And, and so I, I that was, uh, when you get opportunities to go and, going to communities and I know Stuart is very particular about working with kids and communities so as I said before we're guests in those communities and we don't you know just go in and go listen thanks for letting us use your thanks for letting us use your um your site and he's very particular about going in and working with young people and there's a lot of the extras in the coming series are guys from the communities we've been to Devney Gardens um uh, Darndale so we they come in and they see how we work and what the the crew do and Right. And so it's a great. We're very. I like to think we're very respectful, and that, that you know, it's uh, so it's it's great. Right. I used one clip. I should use another one before we go. This was when you were, holy God, yeah. When the when the body was in the in the van. <laughs> How you doing, Gary? Where are you coming from? Uh, the airport. Just picking this fellow. At this time. Yeah, the flight was delayed. You know. Go on. All right. Thank you, Gary. And a happy St Patrick's Day, Gary. What's that? What's what? We're true. What do you need to attract attention for? Relax. We're true. Cool it, boola. Happy days. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get your own Dublin accent right? Uh, Schoolboy football when I was growing up. Right. Yeah, I think that was it's a very simple, short answer. <laughs> OK. Uh, my son and myself, says the caller, met Tom on the pier in Dunleary. Couldn't have been nicer. Got photos with him and tell him he made our day, uh, says Barry. How brilliantly ironic you're talking to Tom Akanidge. And we pause for the Angelus <laughs> aside. All credit to Tom and the team for creating a fantastic and globally successful programme. And this comes from Darren in Rath Farm. Darren is gone. Yeah, Darren's gone. Yeah, it's uh, it's been it's incredibly it, being on set without him without Robbie is kind of it was kind of, you know we went one year then without Aiden which is one thing and then set without Robbie is a kind of a very different place to what it had been. That's funny even when you play that clip back of him getting shot. It's incredibly emo without sounding earnest. It's incredibly emotional to listen to because their relation, um, Darren's the defining personality in in Nidge's life I think and the loss of him is a big story of the next series so his the echo of that that his kind of his ghost or his is is a huge part of his yeah. life so but it's even listening to it it's uh it's really kind of hits you and who wants to take over from Nidge um in the future mm. I think there are a lot of different uh, uh candidates they kind of pop up and I can't give too much away but there's there's a lot there's many candidates I think again that's why those guys have got a a certain shelf life because there's always young guys coming up and uh, you always have to keep on your toes but like we were saying I think one of Nidge's kind of predominant attributes is his survival instinct they always called him the weasel and he's like a rat a dog because he's mm. you get him in a corner and he's he's going to get his way out hell or high water and that's another one of his fascinating attributes he's a he's a born and bred survivor He's fascinating. Uh, 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 you can nearly see when you say you miss Darren or you feel sorry about Darren yeah. being shot. It, it is ama- It must be amazing for you guys getting right in there. Like it must be. How do you st- do it? How do you assume the character? How do you just? Can you hop in and hop out? Can you, you know, go down yeah. the road and have a glass of orange and come back and get back into it? Do you mean in terms of in acting terms? Yeah. Uh, it's a. Uh, the, we film over 11 weeks we film 6 hours over 11 weeks which is quite tight so you have to uh, you have to come prepared and a lot of the scenes are very high octane intense scenes so you've got to um, and there's a lot of um, increasingly with so much attention there's a lot of distractions so you've got to be very focused and disciplined and come and kind of hit the ground running and if Everyone has to be on on the same page in terms of their focus. Does Nidge survive the next series? <laughs> My own life wouldn't be worth living if I told you that. <laughs> I, uh, uh, it, I, I, 
uh, it's it's a fascinating. Uh, I think uh, great artistry or great artists about taking creative risk. I think what Stuart has done is that the third series was one thing that was this incredible phenomenon in terms of his storytelling and the creative risk or I think he the 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 great uh, ch- um, choice he's made in terms of taking different tacks and that he's opened it up to include the Gardaí he's opened the landscape and so it's it, this next one is uh, is the most ambitious right. it includes the Gardaí that's yeah that's one of the um, Be- yeah because this this subculture yeah. seemed to be completely outside of that but i mean we had an interesting um, very very frightening case here ourselves where a very very brave woman gave yeah. evidence um, which must be very, very difficult. And what I often think also as well, if if you are not involved in gangland mm-hmm. and you are living um, next door to them or down the road to them, life must be a hell on wheels. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine it's very, very tough, yeah. Right, so there'll be more Gardaí. Yeah. And are there consequences for Donna having squealed? Uh, there's consequences for... <laughs> there's consequences for characters who uh, want, may or may not want to talk to the police I think that's that's something that always hangs over people like you say someone who wants to go and has information but there's always a threat of them being uh, hurt or Listen I could talk to you forever but it's a fascinating series it has to be said uh, and co- and truly congratulations to you on it Tom Von Lawler otherwise as I say known as Nidge and indeed to all involved thank you, thank Stuart you. seems to be highly respected by all involved Yeah I think he's 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 our leader and we follow where he leads Right <laughs>